All right, as most of you may know, we've been trying to pick one Sabbath a month where we get a chance to hear a little bit more from you. It gives those of us who are preaching a little bit of a break and be leading out. Marlon's going to help me part way through. Um, we are going to be doing over the next maybe couple of months during our uh, special kind of testimony time slash um, interactive time, we're going to be doing the miracles of Jesus. So we're going to be reading through together the miracles and taking a little bit of time to discuss or share um, whatever God puts on your heart about that miracle, a thought that you've had on that. Um, and I think it's especially a topic that we need today. We we put out prayer requests in some of these prayer requests. I'm sure we're hoping for miracles. And we've all seen miracles in our lives, whether we think of it or not. So if you have a story where you can think of where God has done a miracle in your life, this is certainly a time that you can share that. One thing we do ask is, even though I know it's small and most of the time people can hear, we do ask that if you're going to share something, um, James is going to bring a mic over so that we can hear you because I know that sometimes people can't hear as well. Um, so we're going to start together and I'm going to have you guys go with me over to John 2 and we're actually going to do the miracles. This will be fun in chronological order, but we will be jumping around in the gospels because not every gospel has every um, miracle. And I'm going to read for our first one, and then we'll give an opportunity for you guys to share. So John 2, some of you may already know. Uh, without, without getting there yet, does anybody know off the top of your head, what's the first miracle that Jesus did? You can just say it out loud, I don't know you might for that. Yeah, water or wine. So this is the very first one that should be, that we know. So this is John chapter 2. And this is 1 to 11. This is the very first miracle that Jesus performs. And it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheap wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. So I'm going to pause and give an opportunity for anybody to, to share either something regarding this story, share a thought on it, or even a chance to just share, like I said, a miracle. Okay, James has got you covered. You know, a lot of times these, uh, what may seem like a little miracle, mm -hmm. here with changing water into wine for Jesus, it was maybe a little miracle for us. It would be a big one because we don't know how to do that. <laughs> we can change it into Kool-Aid by putting some <laughs> stuff in it or something. Yes. But we have daily in our lives, though, a ton of little miracles if you have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You lose your keys. You misplace your cards. or You, um, you can't get something to work. And uh, or somebody has told you how this is supposed to work, but it was some time ago and you didn't have a chance to write it down or whatever else. And then so you're struggling to figure it out and you bring it to God in prayer and he brings up something to your mind. And it's like, oh, I found it. I found what I needed. Mm -hmm. And you in turn can have a chance to turn around and say, Praise the Lord for these little miracles. How many of them happen in our lives? It's like daily. And mm -hmm. how come God takes our lives so personal and answers such small prayers? But he does. And it seems like it's all day long like that. If you spend a day with God, 
if you need him, he's there. Yes, and thank you for bringing that out, right? This first miracle, you might just kind of look at it and be like, okay, so he turned water to wine, which she said we can't do. It seems small. But think of, think about this. He doesn't start off with this. We can, we're going to get to some miracles that you might call bigger miracles and are maybe better known. Uh, but he, he does this miracle where? He's at a wedding. He's at this place where he obviously has some connection to these people, the bride and the groom somehow. And, oh, they've run out of wine. This is this is a problem. And so, like, what Marlon is saying, while it seems like a little thing, it would have been a big deal to them to have not had this at their, their ceremony. And um, we were talking the other night at Bible study about um, particularly Jewish customs and celebration. They know how to celebrate. And so this is a big, big deal. And this wedding ceremony and this celebration, I should say, more than anything, would have lasted a while. And so to run out would have been a big problem. And he, he does this kind of under the radar, Right, he doesn't make a big deal about oh, I'm going to turn this water into to wine. He just kind of does it in support of these people. Right, this miracle for just I mean everybody's involved, but he does this for this couple, and really think that's very special. It doesn't say you know anything about their response because they're probably out doing whatever. But I guarantee you, they heard that story later. the The person that's coordinating for them, the wedding coordinator, sits in master ceremonies. Wonder how many people are at the wedding. That's a good question. I don't know. I'm sure there's plenty because it says not just Jesus was there, but Jesus and his disciples. So they, it was a wedding where you could bring more than a plus one. He brought a plus 12. <laughs> but yes, uh, wonderful, wonderful thoughts in there. And I think it just shows how much God cares about the little things and, and also cares about he does his miracle at a wedding Wedding, marriage is very important to God's heart. We know that as well. And for him to do his first miracle for a couple, I think is very special. It, it, it kind of reminds me back to the Garden of Eden and the blessing that he did for Adam and Adam and Eve as well, even though we don't get the names of who these people are. And not only does he do this little thing, but it is the best they've ever tasted, right? That's what the master ceremony says. It says, well, usually people bring out the chief stuff, but you, you, this is excellent, right? But who only people that knew that at the time, right, were the servants who had done that and maybe some disciples, but the servants who had knew they poured in water, they saw pouring in water, knew what had happened. And I'm sure, again, it goes out. And it gives us there, right? He performed this and thus his glory was revealed and his disciples put their faith in him. So that first little, little piece there. Anybody have any other thoughts on that one before we go to our, our next one? Okay, I'm going to ask for somebody to read for us this time. This one is John 4, so not very far, 43 to 54. And if I have somebody who's willing to read, this is the next miracle that he does. And this is the healing of an official son. And if you're willing to read, we will ask you to take the microphone. Okay, thank you, Nikki. Here we go. 43 to 54. Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that the prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they had also gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water a wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will no means believe, or by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. And as he was now going down, his servant met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired to them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus had said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. And then it finishes with, this was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judah to Galilee. Notice 
that in here it references the, the first miracle. So we know that people had heard already from even that first miracle about turning water into wine. It says once more he went through there and people had heard of him also because he had been down at the festival. Does anybody have any thoughts on this particular one or a miracle story they'd like to share? Just a thought in general on God's working. To Missy, please. There we go. Many of these people had seen Jesus working. Yes. And had seen the miracle at the wedding. And um, this man who came to him probably saw the miracle. I'm not sure. But he'd heard about Jesus, and obviously he believed in him, and he believed that he could heal his son. Yes, yes. Think of um, at, at that time frame, we all live here in the small town of Wrangell. You all know how things go by word of mouth. It's no different back in that day and age where they don't have the additional electronics that we do. So you know something exciting happened. Everybody knows. Whether they were there or not, as you just said, everybody's going to know. These aren't big towns that he's in. The bigger towns are, are south towards Jerusalem. He's, so he's in tiny, tiny areas in, in Galilee. And I love what you just said there, Missy, about, right, this man had some, some faith because he comes to Jesus, and Jesus' first miracle actually isn't a healing. But this man comes and asks for a healing, right? So we, there's nothing to, there's no precedent at that point for this. There is later, as we see that, uh, tons of people come because once they realize, oh, Jesus can do this. But this is the first guy that comes up and says, my son, and those of you who are parents, I mean, just think of that, that parent heart who's going, at, at reaching for anything, right? Has probably tried things, knows he's sick, and he says, I just can't, right? And, and yet Jesus initially says to him some words that you just look at and you go, hmm. He says, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Again, this is only the second one he's going to perform. He hasn't even performed it yet, and he's already going, I know that if I'm performing these miracles, you guys are going to keep Keep after me. Keep asking. You want to see these signs over and over again. But notice the, the official's response to him. He's like, come down. He, doesn't, he just kind of ignores it. He just says, come down before my child dies. Like, he's not even going to go there. And yet Jesus sees that man's faith and he says, go. He will live. I'm going to pause there and we'll talk a little bit more. Anybody else want to share anything else about the story? Nikki. Not so much about the story, but sure. I yes. do have a miracle that fits along with this. Uh, my grandpa, it was about 60 years ago. My mom was like four. He was in a motorcycle accident and uh, was able to get his bike up. He doesn't remember any of this, but he got home. And my grandma found him on the bathroom floor, passed out, got him to the hospital, ended up in a coma for months. Um, the doctor said if he does ever come out of this, he's going to be a vegetable. Not, not going to make it. So he was ordained. And uh, he just, at one point, I mean, it had been months, and they're like, well, trying to go on with life and get going. Evidently, he just woke up one day, sat up in his bed, and said, I'm hungry. And full function, like nothing ever happened. He has no memory of the accident, but everything else was completely normal. So, and it's been 60 years, so. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, miracles do do still happen and they can be as well that's not that quick but right but when he sets up it just is, is that complete and what we see at the tail end of this story right is that the man also has to take jesus at his word because he doesn't go to the child which is what the man had asked you know come down and see him and he doesn't he just says go he's gonna live and he has to take him at that word and go and so he must have had a little bit of a journey so he's going down and on his way down wherever he's going who does he meet one of his his servants comes up and he says, oh, no, your son's better. The fever's left him. And he asks him, he goes, wait a minute, when, yeah, what time? What time was this? And you all have heard miracle stories that are like this too, where somebody prayed, right? This is, this is the original right here. And he says, it's at this hour. And he goes, that's exactly, that's exactly what Jesus said. Yeah, that, I mean, that's amazing. It wasn't a delay. Sometimes it is a delay, but in this case, it's exactly when Jesus had said, and this man had to trust that. Even though his son was actually better, he didn't know it. He had to trust that when he comes up, but Sturman tells him he's healed. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Any other thoughts on this story? Do these miracles depend on whether we have faith? That's a good good question. I would say a couple different things. In this story, we can assume this man has faith. We don't know much about our previous one that we saw. We don't know about the couple. But Jesus still does that miracle. And I think that's a also a valid thing. Jesus does miracles whether or not the person who's receiving it is maybe worthy of it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and I'm using air, air quotes to that because who is actually worthy. But a lot of times we will see, and later on you brought that up, that Jesus does ask him about the faith part of that. But sometimes he doesn't. And I think that's to the point of we hear in the Bible too where it says the rain falls on the just and unjust. God provides miracles for all of us. Now the key, I think, is whether we are paying attention. (laughs) Whether we are paying attention to whether he's doing that or not. And I can think of one story, which is not my story to tell, but it'll be my last one and I will share it and then we'll take a little little music break. Um, Those of you who remember Charlie Miggs, our previous pastor, told this story and I'm going to share it right here just to to answer your question about the, the... point of faith. Um, He told me this again when I saw him recently. When he was an unbeliever, um, he was, he said, in the throes of addiction, and he was trying to quit. He knew his life was a mess, and he was sitting in his apartment or whatever he was in for, like, days, and he just was just tore up, and he's like, man, God, if you are real, just send somebody over here or something like that. And could we say, did did he have some faith in that? Maybe, maybe not. Even he would say, I don't know. But there comes a knock on his door out of the blue. It's a terrible day, by the way. He said it was rainy, it was blowing. It's like, who is out there in this, in this weather? And he goes to the door, and here's this. He s- describes him as a little short man. And he comes up, and he goes, how's it going? Charlie's like, oh, oh okay. And he, goes, and he tells the man, he says, man, I've just been you know, just wondering about God. My life's a mess. He says, I can help you with that comes on in he's there for bible studies and what had happened was this months before this charlie had been at some health fair something or other at the fairgrounds and the church was there and he would put his name in for bible studies and they hadn't been able to get a hold of him at that point but they went back through their what they call cold leads and they gave this name to this guy who hunted down charlie's door at that exact moment that um, God was, was calling to him and he asked him. Now, that increased his faith, and that's something we'll probably want to discuss too, is like what's the role of miracles in there. I think more than anything, I'm not sure if you could say he did, but he definitely did afterwards. But God knows, knows the timing of those things. Well, would you turn with me? It looks like we're headed for Mark here. Mark 1, 21 through 27. Mark 1. Mark 1, 21. Then they went out into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one with authority and not as a scribe. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had come, uh, convulsed the man, And cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And then they were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, and what new doctrine is this? For for with authority he commanded even the unclean spirit, and they obeyed him. And it says, And immediately his fame spread throughout all that region around Judea. All right. Anybody had an experience kind of like this? I mean, something to observe here. He's in church. The synagogue is their, their church. 
there's men there with an evil spirit. You know, sometimes we fail to kind of remember that evil spirits come in with people. They walk right in their back door sometimes. And uh, they enter your church services. Spoke with authority, Jesus did. And um, he spoke as somebody who believed. When somebody says you speak with authority, especially when you're dealing with the scriptures, it's because you know. You know who you're talking about. You know the power that is there. You know what has been written in the scriptures. And you're coming out with authority when you talk. Some of the most amazing speakers I've ever heard are like that. They, they have by faith known. Um, when you were, you were talking about that, it just, ma- it just occurred to me, this is why sometimes when you're just studying together, that, that Jesus is adding here to the, obviously it's his third miracle that we see, but that first miracle is about those physical needs. The second miracle still physical needs, but we're talking about like people and not just like uh, objects. And this third one now, he really is starting to show that he's master of the spiritual realm as well. And it just hit me of that, like, this is why it says at the end, his fame just goes, Phew, because not only can he turn water to wine and he can feel the, uh, heal these physical things, but he is the master of these spirits, which is in this, the emotional and spiritual realm. So he can do it all. So it's not just speaking with authority that's impressing them, but it's obviously that the spirit world recognizes this authority and that he has it over, over them. Not only recognizes his authority, but calls him by name. Oh, and yeah. says, I know who you are. Yeah, I mean, if you're in this church, you would be impressed. Even at, as the devil has said, he, he recognizes who, who he is, the Holy One. You know, if you're sitting there and you're, you're actually even not trying really hard not to believe and not to be following Jesus, and you hear this evil spirit say this, it's got to take you back. Like, you know, there's some overwhelming evidence here that Jesus is the Son of God. Speaking with authority, I mean, we've all heard good pastors, good um, speakers who can do this again because they they know. But, um, yeah, it must have been amazing to hear Jesus speak and read the scriptures um, because he does it as a person that has a, a lot of faith. The other thing I wanted to comment on, too, about the authority and that we see this in Paul too. Is why does Jesus tell him to be be quiet? And, and there's I think there's a twofold. One, you know, nobody needs to be hearing the the devil speaking. But two, two, it's also because, like with the story of Paul when he heals a demon possessed girl, when you hear this kind of things coming from, uh, yeah, from a, the source like that people are going to start thinking you're crazy. Do you know what I mean? And they're hearing that and they're going, wait a minute. So even Jesus at that point is like shutting that down. And he does that multiple places too because he knows that if it's coming from the wrong direction, people are just not going to take it seriously. So I just wanted to, to point that out as well because we see that in a couple places. Okay, th- I'm going to pick up uh, Luke on the exact same story. See if there's just a little bit something different that's added, but kind of... While you were talking there, I made a quick read down there, and it's pretty much almost word for word the same story, which is great because one gospel is telling is, is confirming what the other gospel is saying. And this is Luke 4, 31 through 36. And then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his words was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. 
And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What, do, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And again, Jesus rebukes him and, and saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him into the midst, he came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all astonished and spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority, the power, he commands the unclean spirit, and they come out. And a report about him went out throughout the region. It's interesting. He doesn't, he doesn't make a very long speech that we can tell in, in this as far as what we're seeing. But does it make a big difference in your life to know that God can get rid of the demons in your life? I hope so. Because all of us have them at certain times. They may not be the kind that possess you and take over you. But how many of you can control your mind? You got a song that you just abhor, but you couldn't get away from it. And so the thing is just torturing you keep playing over and over in your head and you you call out to God, Lord, change the channel, take this song away from me. Get my mind off of this subject. I want somewhere else. I want it pure, holy, you know, the things that we are told in the scriptures to meditate on. And, um, and then in just a matter of moments, it's gone. I don't know about you, but I can testify. It, it happens to me a lot. And I believe in that prayer, because it is answered a tons. Um, I'm just telling you, believe in God, and he will take these things away from you. Any other comments on uh, your struggles? Miracles in your life? Okay. Let's uh, go one more time. Let's look at... Um, uh, Matthew 8, 14 and 15. If somebody else would uh, um, look up Mark 1, 9 through 31. And at one other person, Luke 4, 38 through 39. I have Mark 1, 29. starting at 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Peter and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law, or Peter's mother-in-law, was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. We're seeing, again, following this chronologically, that this is just exploding because now they're bringing all kinds of things to Jesus, <laughs> not just um, diseases, but even, like they said, demon-possessed, where it may not be as obvious or Maybe it is obvious, not a physical ailment for somebody. So the Matthew, Matthew 8, 14 through 15. Um, now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with fever. And he touched her, and the fever had left her, and she rose and served them. Now, why did Jesus just do that? Is he like, hey, I just, uh, I need you to serve me a cup of tea, so I'm going to heal you? No, he, he recognized a problem there. He recognized somebody suffering with a fever. And the fact that he, <laughs> he healed her, and she got up and returns a favor by serving them, it's, it's a response. I would hope it's a response from us as Christians. We serve the Lord out of love. Has anybody got, 
um, the Luke, Luke uh, 4, 38 through 39. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Yeah, so again, we have all the Gospels, all the Gospels coming together, talking about what seems like not a really a big story in the life of Jesus, but we've got at least three of the Gospels telling the same story here. And uh, it kind of makes, a, um, makes you understand that the Scriptures and all these disciples were there. They were present. They were part of it. Um, and, and it confirms. I, I like it a lot. Marlon, I just want to add something here, too, because the first miracle we see, again, we saw for a wedding, a wedding for this couple, and this miracle, like you said, seems small, but he, he's doing this for somebody that he probably knows much well, and more closely, his mom. right? It's a mother, mother-in-law of one of his disciples, Peter, yeah. and Peter's mother-in-law is what it says, um, and what is, like, a special thing to, you know, he walks in and notices she's not feeling, she's not feeling well. And I think this speaks to how much God cares about the little and the big, as we just said. This is one singular person in this story. I think the thing that stood out to me here is, you know, that Jesus did this. And I think that we have authority to do that. When, you know, we often get a cold or we're struggling with something that makes us kind of sick, and we forget the fact that we can say, Get away from me in the name of Jesus. You know, his authority it, it comes right into our life. I, I, I like what you're thinking because it's a, in these cases, when I'm praying for myself, possibly, mostly I'm usually praying for somebody else. And there you can see they're struggling with either a lot of anger and fury and things like that. You can recognize especially as a Christian, you recognize the demons have got a hold of people, and you can say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit, cast the demons away from them people, and please give them peace. You know, and God answers that. We gave God permission for him to work on somebody else's behalf. Until then, he He's not going to force his way in on people who haven't asked for it. But if he's got a friend, a, a, a stranger even, who praying for you, yes, yes. He, he's anxious to answer this prayer. He, he's really anxious. And, and it's amazing to see how fast things can change in a situation there. And uh, praise the Lord because he does answer prayers. And he does it with his authority because he is the Son of God and Lord of all. 